All right, we're back with more Delete Laws Madness. Uh, I meant to do this the other day, but didn't. Uh, and then yesterday, I, well, let's just say, I hope you guys never have to go through Phantom Pain. It sucks. Only thing you can do it, on the bad days is curl up in a ball and cry. So that being said, I'm here and I'm actually recording in the day instead of middle of the night because I don't want to fall too far behind because I, I've decided Delete Laws claims to be an actor. We all know he's a failed actor, but I've decided He's a failed Shakespearean actor. And the reason I say he's a failed Shakespearean actor is because what we have today is much ado about nothing. It, he's stuck in a side quest uh, that is absolutely meaningless. But he's taking up the court's time. He's taking up... The attorney time he's taking up specifically Kate's money yet with this side mission. And it's ridiculous. It's all for nothing. That being said, let's jump into it. So the when I last left you, it was on docket number 111, which was Kate's opposition to the motion to strike the so we're we're, we're still de de dealing with the contempt motion that well it's not contempt so it's it's never going to lead to contempt but we're how many motions in on it and so mr wish says well, it was excusable neglect because we misread the docket. So, docket number 112, Judge Burroughs. Electronic or on January 16th, 2023. Plaintiff filed his second motion for contempt as to defendant Peter, ECF number 103. Pursuant to Local Rule 7.1b2, Peter's response was due on or before January 30th, 2023, but Peter did not file her opposition until February 1st, 2023. This two-day delay prompted plaintiff to file an emergency motion to strike Peter's opposition, ECF number 110, which Peter opposed that same day, ECF number 111. In her opposition, Council that had erroneously calendared the deadline for, for the opposition as February 2nd, 2023, due to a notation in the docket entry that accompanied plaintiff's second motion for contempt. The court has the discretion to not strike an opposition because the filing was two days late due to a good faith misunderstanding. See Bennett versus City of Holyoke from the First Circuit in 2004. Under the excusable neglect rubric, courts are permitted, when appropriate, to accept late filings caused by inadvertence or mistake. End quote. And generally, the district courts have broad discretion in ass assessing such case management decisions, citing Perry versus Wolliver, First Circuit 2007, which was citing Perez Cordero versus Walmart, Puerto Rico. First Circuit 2006. Here, the court, in its discretion, will not strike Peter's opposition because it credits the representation by Peter's counsel that the delay was the product of a good faith mistake and because plaintiff was not prejudiced by this delay. Plaintiff's motion to, distri motion to strike is therefore denied. So, basically, the court said, I'm taking Benjamin Wish at his word that this is why it was late. It had absolutely no impact on the litigation. 
Therefore, motion to strike is denied. And we now have a hissy fit over it. So I'm going to go a little out of order here because we have DACA 113, which is Notice of Supplemental Authorities, Re 59, Second Motion to Correct, Correction Error, that I, 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 I seriously, I don't even know what to say about that, which means I'll say a lot about it because I don't know what the hell he's doing. But I think that's him saying, well, you said right here, the docket right above this, that it's fine to be late. Therefore, blah, blah, blah. I think that's where he's going. So I'm going to come back to that. We're, we're going to stay on this side quest for now. And... we have the motion for recons reconsideration of plaintiff's motion to strike. Now, I know what a lot of you are going to say, at least those of you who watch Merb in addition to me. You're going to say, this is exactly what Merb told him to do, which it's true. It, it's, it's almost like, He's watching Merb's videos. He might be watching mine. I have no idea. But he's watching Merb's videos. Merb said the next step would be a motion to reconsider. But there's no guarantee that works. And and here, here's the thing. Here, here's the thing. Merb is under the, he's of the opinion that Judge Burroughs got this wrong. Whatever. Like I said in my last video, I think it's kind of a catch-22 if, if you file your response before you know you're late. You can't file a motion asking for a time extension. So if what Benjamin Wish said is true, he couldn't, or at least he wouldn't, have filed before unless he had noticed, you know, if, but either way, it doesn't matter because like I said, Judge Burroughs is not going to hold Kate in contempt over this. So it, once again, it's much ado about nothing. The, the absolute best case scenario for delete laws is his motion to strike is granted. Well, at this point, motion for reconsideration of his motion to strike. The court says, all right, we've struck the response. Well, opposition. It, it's gone. But th they're not going to then say, well, now that that opposition's gone, it's unopposed, so Kate's in contempt. No. What they're going to do is that they'll say, all right, either either she'll sua sponte on her own, deny the motion for contempt like she has in the past. Remember, she has denied motions for contempt without response in the past. So she could just do that here. Or she gives a show cause order and set and orders Benjamin Wish to show cause why Kate is not in contempt. He takes the exact opposition motion that he that was just struck, he retitles it at as his show cause motion and it's accepted. And then Judge Burroughs says, all right, Kate's not in contempt. That's the 
absolute best case scenario for delete laws. That's why I said, this is much ado about nothing. This is a side quest that has absolutely nothing to do with the actual litigation, with the heart of the matter. So, but I'm going to discuss that at, at the end. So, motion for reconsideration of plaintiff's motion to strike. Plaintiff, Jose de Castro, hereby moves this honorable court to reconsider its denial of my emergency motion to strike defendant Catherine Peters' late opposition to plaintiff's second motion for contempt at ECF number 110. In support of this motion, plaintiff submits a mem memorandum of law, which is fully incorporated herein. Background. On January 16th, 2023, plaintiff filed plaintiff's second motion for contempt at ECF number 103, asking for the court to bring judicial notice to this court of additional contempt by Peter. The motion was immediately served by the ECF system to Peter. Pursuant to local rule 7.1b2, Peter's opposition was due by January 30th, 2023 within 14 days after the motion is served. However, Peter filed her opposition to plaintiff's second motion for contempt at ECF 109 on February 1st, 2023, multiple days late. Well, hey, at least this time, he understands that February 1st is not February 2nd. So he gets a gold star for that at least. On Fe February 2nd, 2033, <laughs> I spoke too soon about the gold star, about 10 years too soon, apparently. Plaintiff filed an emergency motion to strike the de defendant Catherine Peters' late opposition to plaintiff's second at ETF number 111. I, I mean, yeah, I. I make fun of his spelling errors frequently. But here's the thing. If you miscapitalize, it's an error, but it's excusable. If you write two and you put T-O-O -O instead of T-O, it's the wrong word. It's a spelling error but it's excusable. Defendant is inexcusable because that, that just shows he didn't run spell check. You know, the first two examples I gave, spell check is not necessarily going to catch those. But defendant, that, that just shows he hasn't run spell check. Ugh. But on, on February 2nd, 2033, plaintiff filed an emergency motion to strike defendant Catherine Peters' late opposition to plaintiff's second motion for contempt at ECF number 111, moving this court to, one, strike the opposition under Rule 6B because this court did not have the discretion to allow a late filing absent a motion to file late, and two, to strike the opposition under Rule 6B because this court did not have the discretion to allow a late filing absent excusable neglect. Plaintiff cited Lujan versus National Wildlife Federation Supreme Court 1990, which is binding on this court for the lack of leave to file a late response. Plaintiff cited Pioneer is it Pioneer? I don't know. It, uh, Pioneer, Pioneer in Services versus Brunswick Associates Partnership, uh, also from the Supreme Court in 1993, which is binding on this court for the lack of excusable neglect. This court then made a correctable error by not striking the late filing. This court did not have discretion to allow a late filing absent a motion to file late pursuant to Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 6B. 
argument. Rule 6B sets out the proper approach in the case of late filings. When by these rules or by a notice given thereunder or by order of court, an act is required or allowed to be done at or within a specified time, the court for cause shown may at any time in its discretion, one, with or with, with or without motion or notice, order the period enlarged if request therefore is made before the expiration of the period originally prescribed or as extended by a previous order, or two, upon motion made after the expiration of the specified period, permit the act to be done where the failure to act was the result of excusable neglect. That's the full quote, well, the, the full text of Rule 6B from the civil, Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. Not properly cited. That's Rule 6B. This provision not only specifically confers the discretion relevant to, to the present issue, but also provides the mechanism by which that discretion is to be invoked and exercised. Okay, and I'm I'm curious. He has within the quote three asterisk stars. 721 and then three, four asterisk stars, 42. Are, are those from it's just, it, it, it's awkward. I'm wondering if it's a hyperlink where he copied this from or, or in, in, in a way it looks kind of like um, page notations within legal opinions uh, when they're published that since you're not reading them in their original form, that they'll have page notations within the text and but you you wouldn't have that if you're just citing rule 6b. I didn't pay attention within the block of his argument three times. It, it at, at best, it's awkward. At, I just, I don't know what he's trying to do with it. Which I'm sure is a, you know, exciting tangent for all of you. Um, so this provision not only specifically confer, confers the discretion relevant to the present issue, but also provides the mechanism by which that distance is to be exercised. First, any extension of a time limitation must be for cause shown. Second, although extensions before expiration of the time per period may be with or without motion or notice, any post deadline extension must be upon motion made and is permissible only where the failure to meet the deadline was the result of excusable neglect. Thus, in order to receive the affidavits here, the district court would, would have had to regard the very filing of the late document as the motion made to file it. And then we have a five in there for some reason that isn't in the same format as the other numbers. So it's just awkward. It would have had to interpret cause shown as to mean merely cause. The respondent made no showing of cause at all. And finally, it would have had to find as a substan substantive matter that there was indeed cause for the late filing and that the failure to file on time was the result of excusable neglect. The, 
that sentence was atrocious. It, it was absolutely atrocious, and it's almost impossible to read. S seriously. It's one, two, three, four, five, six lines long. It, it's just awful. And I'm apparently quoting Luhan again. Oh, wait, was this entire thing a quote? No, not just this block of rule 6B, but that th this was entirely a quote? Number one, the Supreme Court clerks need to write better sentences because that was atrocious. So, back to the argument, apparently. Additionally, this court has mistakenly identified forgetting as excusable error by not applying the excusable neglect rubric correctly. Pioneer makes it clear that not stating a reason at all is not excusable. More than a good faith mistake is required. But waiting until the last day to file each motion and response is also not in good faith, but rather an offensive strategy strategy employed consistently by Peter. Um, seriously? Th th this entire second half of that sentence. But waiting until the last day to file each motion and response is also not in good faith, but rather an offensive strategy employed consistently by Peter. Well, then what the hell is the point of having a deadline? If, if it's supposed to be filed earlier, the deadline would be earlier. <sighs> Additionally, something would have had to happen that is not within the council's reasonable control. The calendar is within the council's reasonable control. Apparently, he thinks that visible neglect requires force majeure, act of God. So, it, 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 it's excusable neglect, not excusable because whatever. It, it's neglect would imply that it is a mistake. The reading the calendar wrong on the docket happens. It, it shouldn't, you don't want it to happen, but it happens. It, <clears throat> hey, another long block text. There is, of course, a range of possible explanations for a party's failure to comply with a court-ordered filing deadline. At one end of the spectrum, a party may be prevented from complying by forces beyond its control, such as by an act of God or unforeseeable human intervention. That's the force majeure I just mentioned. <laughs> At the other, a party simply may choose to flout, the, flout a deadline. In between, like cases where a party may choose to miss a deadline, although for a very good reason, such as to render first aid to an accident victim discovered on the way to the courthouse, as well as cases where a party misses a deadline through inadvertence, miscalculation, or negligence. Petitioner contends that the bankruptcy court was correct when it first interpreted Rule uh, 9006B1 to require a showing that the movement's failure to comply with the court's deadline was caused by circumstances beyond its reasonable control. Petitioner suggests that 
exacting enforcement of filing deadlines is essential to the bankruptcy code's goals of certainty and finality in resolving disputed claims. Under petitioner's view, any showing of fault on the part of the late filer would defeat a claim of excusable neglect. Citing Pioneer in Services versus Brunswick Associates from the Supreme Court in 1993. Now, you'll notice in that very long block quote from the Supreme Court ruling, there was no holding. That was all, it, it, it was background. It was, this is what the petitioner in the bankruptcy filing wants us to rule. It, it's not what the Supreme Court ruled. I'm not going to look it up to see what the Supreme Court ruled because I don't care. Like I said, this is much ado about nothing. But if Delete Laws wants us to care, it should be in his motion. Not that... Not the setup. He needs the punchline. Although the trial judge has discretion to determine whether something is excusable neglect, it requires the, the rubric to be applied correctly. And Pioneer does not allow just any mistake. Doesn't it? We don't know. You, you, didn't, you didn't give us the holding. Conclusion. For the foregoing reasons, plaintiff moves this court to strike Peter's opposition to, to plaintiff's second motion for contempt. Additionally, if opposition is not stricken, plaintiff moves this court for leave to file a reply to the opposition with documentary evidence as the opposition appears to be the fall of perjured statement again. Once again, the opposition well, it's not a sworn statement, so it's not perjury. And, ooh, he, he annoys me. And he's annoying the court as well. So, we actually, normally... Let's see. So that was 114. 115, Judge Allison D. Burroughs endorsed order entered denying 114 motion for reconsideration re 10 emergency motion to strike. And, and I, I just, I like the way motion so ordered or motion denied, so ordered. That, that's just a beautiful stamp. This is all I do about nothing. It does not matter. So let's close those on. And we'll go back in time now to 113. And that's back in time all the way to yesterday for 113, which is taking us way back in time. So this is Notice of Supplemental Authorities, re 59, second motion to correct, correction error, upload filed by DeCastro. So scroll way back, 59, was all the way back on Veterans Day. That's our Mistis Day for our European friends. November 11th, 2022. Just as an update, a refresher, that's the motion to correct record or alternatively to reconsider motion to transfer venue preliminary injunction where he's I, Jose de Castro, plaintiff, hereby move this 
honorable court to correct its record under civil procedure rule 60A and record the plaintiff's voluntary dismissal and notice as filed before the defendant's answers to my complaint, which is true and in the interest of justice. In the alternative, to reconsider my motion to transfer venue, number 52 in the docket, and move for preliminary injunction. In support of this motion, blah, blah, blah. So that's going all the way back to all his nunk pro tunk, and I swear it, I tried to dismiss before they filed their answers, and it's totally unfair that you won't let me. So yesterday, even though there is absolutely no motion on the docket, there. He filed a notice of supplemental authority to nothing. So, plaintiff Jose de Castro hereby notifies this court and all parties that since this motion was filed, I assume he means number 59. I mean, it doesn't say. It just says notice of supplemental authority, both in the caption and the header here. says number 59 in the docket, but 59 isn't pending, so he, it's either to a motion that's not pending or it, it's supplementing nothing. So hereby notifies this court and all, all parties that, that since this nebulous was filed, that additional authorities have been established from which to cite and support this motion. Pursuant to Federal Rules of Civil Procedure 32.1 and the established tradition of allowing supplemental authorities by this court, I do offer as follows. Points and authorities. A. Late Filings are allowed nunk pro tunk due to mistake without requesting leave, regardless of the federal rules of civil procedure and go to decisions. See the order from February 3rd, 2023, in De Castro versus Abrams et al., where the judge has ordered that, contrary to the U.S. Supreme Court decisions and federal rule of civil procedure, declaring that the court maintains no discretion, that a circuit court judge does indeed have discretion to allow late filed motion practice, even when leave was not motioned prior. That's one of my civil procedure uh, professors, big pet peeves. It's not motion, it's moved. You don't motion you move. The motion is the filing. It, this is the motion. You move the court with a motion. The order further provides that the excusable neglect test is provided simply by naming it. I include a copy of the unpublished order by reference to ECF number 112 in this case. So, he's saying, you were wrong, but I want you to apply that wrongness to me. But you're still wrong. Well, for starters, for starters, Once again, he, he says, the order further provides that the excusable neglect test is provided simply by naming it. That, that's a nothing of a sentence, but Benjamin Wish said, this is what caused my neglect. I, I or someone at the firm misread the docket because of this. Now, delete laws doesn't have to agree that that's an adequate reason, but the judge did. Whereas, 
in all his, his nunk pro tunk nonsense, she didn't find he had an adequate excuse. And furthermore, in this case, in the unnecessary side quest, much ado about nothing, the excusable neglect had no prejudicial impact. At worst, it delayed the decision by two days. A decision that wasn't going to be in his favor regardless. It ha this side quest has absolutely no impact on the actual litigation. Whereas, if the judge had granted his nunk pro tunk motion, even if he had good excuse, it it has it, it, it prejudices Josh and Kate because remember he said on November sixth, "Well, I've dismissed the case. I, I've dismissed. I've dismissed. It's okay." The answers were due November 7th, so they filed their answers. And that locked him in. He could no longer voluntarily dismiss without their consent. And they said, no, we do not consent. We want this decided so you can't run off to of California and refile. And then we have to spend me in California, although it'll be an easy dismissal for lack of jurisdiction. They want finality. Like I've said, I think it was a ploy because if they had not filed their answers on the 7th, you you bet your ass he goes in on the 8th and says, default, 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 they're in default, give, give me a default judgment. I, I was bluffing. So that's not excusable neglect. It, it's gamesmanship. This is just, this is asinine. So, I, I mean, the court's going to ignore this. Uh, I mean, it, it's it's not even a motion. So, the, will the court even respond to it? Will, will, will they say, yeah, we, we're still the... 959 because it's repetitive nonsense. You need to stop. You're going to be sanctioned at some point for wasting the court's time. So I said earlier that at the end I I'd discuss the state of the case. And So we're, we're kind of stuck in limbo because Delete Laws is on this side quest. It's all he cares about at the moment. Um, although I heard rumor, I, I, I watched one of Merb's videos earlier. Apparently he's filed against Kate in California State Court. Good luck with that. I, I mean, talk about lack of jurisdiction. Uh, so we're, we're just, we're stuck in limbo right now because, let's see. January 11th, he filed the first motion for leave to file second amended complaint, which was granted on January 12th. Leave to file granted, but Judge Burroughs did not give a due date. So we are now 
over four weeks past this motion. So we and then we have the motions to dismiss were filed on December 23rd, both by Kate and Josh. So we have motions to dismiss that have been pending for a month and a half. But he he's essentially put a pause on that with no end in sight. So at some point they need to basically file a motion, sort of a put up or shut up motion with the court saying, hey, look, this is prejudicial. He needs to either file or you need to rule on the motion. And so we have in the rule of civil procedure, Rule 41, dismissal of actions, and 41B, involuntary dismissal. So if the plaintiff fails to prosecute or to comply with these rules or a court order, a defendant may move to dismiss the action or any claim against it. Unless the dismissal order states otherwise, a dismissal under this subdivision, B, and any dismissal not under this rule, except one for lack of jurisdiction, improper venue, or failure to join a party under Rule 19 operates as adjudication on the merits, meaning it's dismissed with prejudice, unless it states otherwise. So basically, I'd say, hey, look, judge, this is, at the very least, a failure to prosecute this amended the supplemental claim he's trying to add and we get a delay tactic on the other claims so that he can keep us in court keep costing us money in lawyer fees defending nonsense motions that have absolutely nothing to do with the litigation because that's what he's doing I have a feeling that he wants to keep it in this stage. He does not want the case to advance to discovery. He, he wants to kick the can down the road as far as he can before it's finally dismissed on the 12B6 motions. And I think the reason for that, number one, discovery is hard. He doesn't know what he's doing. So he does he just doesn't want to do it. But number two, he doesn't want to be subjected to discovery. He does he doesn't want Josh and Kate to have the access to all of the damaging information about him. Just think about that. They're going to get all the skeletons in his closet. And he doesn't want that. So he wants this to end before discovery, but he wants it to last as long as it possibly can before discovery in order to cost them money. That's why he's on these side quests, ignoring the supplemental complaint trying to delay Judge Burroughs' ruling on their motions to dismiss. At this point, Josh and Kate just need to say, hey, Judge, let's have a ruling. It, it needs to happen. Or he, he needs to file his supplemental complaint. And 
if, if he does, that'll be dismissed quickly too, because it's just as much nonsense as his main complaint, as the existing complaint, as the first complaint, as the amended complaint. As it's just it's it's all nonsense. So with that, like I said, I I meant to do most of this yesterday, some of it even before, but unfortunately pain got in the way. But I there's another video. I hope to turn them out back to back last night, but didn't. But the I'm going to be covering near the Logan Paul lawsuit. Um for for those of you that have followed it, I'm very excited because if you followed the drama between Logan Paul, Coffeezilla, and then Attorney Tom over the CryptoZoo scam, well, a couple of weeks ago, Attorney Tom announced he was going into arbitration against Logan Paul. But there's now a class action lawsuit, so... I'm going to cover that very soon, and I hope you guys join me for that. With that, please like, share, subscribe, do all the fun youtube things that I always forget to mention at the beginning of the video. And with that, I will see you guys very soon. Thanks for joining me. Bye-bye.